I'm Jaris Hansen, and visiting with us today is Eric Nakajima, who is the Assistant Secretary for Innovation Policy of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And he's part of the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. And it's great to have you here, Eric. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Now, that's a whole mouthful. But what is innovation policy, and what are you doing in this, this office? Well, innovation policy can mean a lot of different things, but I think the biggest, uh, the, the fundamental principle that Governor Patrick and the administration has led with is uh, that the innovation economy and innovation in general is a cornerstone for the Massachusetts economy and really our heritage, actually. If you go back, I mean, since, presumably since the cod fishing uh, was, the, was the, uh, the coin of the realm, quite literally and figuratively, in Massachusetts 300 years ago, uh, ever since then, we've repeatedly innovated uh, models for society, for social organization, for religious organization, um, for business models, and as well as new technologies. It's something that's true from the Industrial Revolution uh, straight up to the present day. And uh, one of the things that happened around 30 or 40 years ago that's particularly relevant for the Pioneer Valley and places in uh, West Central and Southeastern Massachusetts is the cord got cut between um, the innovation economy as it was developing and, and prospering in places like Silicon Valley and Route 128 and the downtown Boston and Cambridge and Kendall Square and the economies of regions outside of that area that were traditionally relying on manufacturing. So if you look back and you can see this in data, you can see it in the communities and the investment and the wealth we have, um, that there were really differing trajectories and so there were fewer job opportunities and fewer new company startups uh, that, were, that were connected to the global economy as it was changing. And so that's led a lot of people to believe that the innovation economy is something for Boston, it's something for Cambridge, it's something for young kids who grow up and go to college and move away to Boulder, Colorado or San Francisco. And one of the things that we, that the governor's committed to, but something that we've really noticed, is how untrue that is, how in fact you can see green shoots uh, significant developments, significant opportunities in the economy and socially and otherwise uh, in every region of the Commonwealth. And we think by investing in the fundamentals that enable competitive advantage like infrastructure and education, but also, which is a, the big triad the governor always talks about for his economic strategy, is innovation, education, and infrastructure. So infrastructure and education are fundamental building blocks that if you don't connect people to high quality uh, educations at a young age, at a pre-K level, through uh, elementary school and secondary, but also give them opportunities to learn and grow as they move through their careers, then fundamentally you're not competitive. And, and we don't have a single child, a single person uh, it sounds an awful thing to say, but you, whether you're talking about economically or morally, there's not a single human being we can afford to waste in our society. And so we need to make sure we have the policies and investments that can make sure we can give opportunity at a starting level and throughout people's lives to everyone. Infrastructure, of course, make sure we can move goods and ideas uh, and people uh, to where they can connect to markets. So that can mean anything from reinvesting in our uh, roads and rail and bridges, also to broadband and making sure that every community has an opportunity uh, to connect to high quality broadband so they can get information, they can be involved in e-commerce and things like that. So that's education and infrastructure. And innovation, uh, I think the fundamental premise, even though there are investments and programs and policies that we're doing through our office and through the administration generally that are connecting to uh, new economic opportunities throughout the Commonwealth. The fundamental premise of it is that we can reach across to people in academic life, civic life, and business life throughout the Commonwealth and surface um, things that they're doing that are transforming their approach to either assets in the area, it could be in agriculture and, and uh, small business life, um, or to new technologies that could come out of the university or be spun out of local companies, and then try to build the infrastructure that can both accelerate that growth uh, locally and then also uh, get away from this idea that we have a Boston economy, we have a New York economy, we have a Silicon Valley economy, and then all the rest of us who are living wherever we live. We, there are ways in which we can tangibly connect the competitive advantages uh, of this region and other regions like it um, to the high growth areas like Kendall Square in Boston and elsewhere on the planet and, and do it in a way that we're not doing anyone a favor. This isn't a handout. It's not a, it's not a gesture of some sort. It's based on looking at and saying, look, there's something you're doing here in Amherst, in Greenfield, Northampton, you know, South Hadley, Holyoke, Springfield. There's something you're doing here that is fundamentally competitive on world markets. 
and maybe there's something you need in terms of infrastructure or connectivity or some other kind of assistance to really make it fully flower, but we can do that when we can build upon an advantage in which we're not selling anyone a bill of goods. We're saying if you locate in Holyoke, if you locate in Amherst what you're doing, if you take advantage of this uh, new investment that's being made at UMass Amherst in a life science, major first class life sciences building, you're going to find top flight, world class uh, people and organizations and companies right here in the Pioneer Valley. Well, you mentioned that there is a strategic partnership between the government, state government, and local communities, sometimes private initiatives. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the life sciences and, and how that affects innovation policy. You know, what do you expect to come out of the new program in life sciences? Well, as a lot of people know by now, the governor and the legislature working with academic and uh, business leaders had launched a life sciences initiative back in 2008. So it was a 10 year billion dollar initiative. Uh, that initiative was premised again really on the same thing I was just saying that we have an opportunity to lead in the Commonwealth on cures so we can actually lead in discoveries that solve complex medical challenges both here uh, in the United States and in Massachusetts as well as also in other countries uh, in terms of their quality of life and uh, in that we, we have all the institutions and the brain power and organizations to do that but there is an opportunity to build on that strength and accelerate of that, that competitive advantage, particularly when, if you go back to a point in time five years ago, you saw other uh, nations and other states really looking at how they could grow upon strengths and expand them. Now, what does that mean for the Pioneer Valley? What does it mean for Massachusetts uh, outside of, uh, again, outside of Boston and the Longwood medical area? Um, we've always believed that there, there are tremendous assets here. Um, back, I think even, I forget how many years ago, but six or seven years ago, there was a partnership formed between UMass, Amherst, and Bay State Medical Center um, with uh, the Pioneer Valley Life Sciences Institute. And that was built on the belief that we had a uh, first class uh, teaching hospital and place for, uh, for uh, medical placements for new medical students and doctors down in Springfield. So a great, a great base of practitioners and a great interaction with, uh, with, a, with a patient base down there. And then uh, outstanding uh, engineers and, uh, and other uh, life sciences related professionals who are not medical doctors but are involved in developing therapeutic devices and cures and insights here at UMass Amherst. So if you fast forward from there, what we've been doing uh, with the Massachusetts Life Sciences Center and UMass Amherst, people like Vice Chancellor Mike Malone and uh, Jim Campestran and the researcher groups across the campus is trying to figure out how do we program uh, a, a building or a center uh, on, the, on the Amherst campus that can connect with the best trends that we're seeing uh, across uh, medical care and healthcare and life sciences discovery, both in Boston and outside of Boston, and also incumbent assets we have in the Pioneer Valley in um, precision manufacturing that are already involved in doing some medical device development in bioinformatics, things that are going on at Bay State uh, where they're already leading and thinking about how you develop and analyze and synthesize cu uh, cures and ther therapies that are based upon, again, this broad patient base that they have and actually a repository of data about patients that go about a significant, uh, uh, significant number of years and even decades. Well, what did we do? I mean, so all that sounds like a, just a bunch of jargon about uh, different kinds of things one might do. Really, it came down to people, and it came down to connections, and it came down to networks. So one of the things that we thought, uh, both at the state level as well as also uh, working with the campus, is that we had just a lot of really good people in the area and a lot of really good kinds of companies, but frankly, the level of connectivity on a practical basis between uh, research groups and capacities at the university and industry in a way that we could operationalize those insights and create a, a, a more transparent and easy flow between the campus and the industry, industrial community, both locally and, and, uh, and statewide and nationally, really wasn't there. So the campus engaged for like, uh, around a year, uh, ending in, uh, in uh, May of uh, 2013, a process in which they uh, had focus groups, brought dozens of people from industry, both nationally and locally, uh, a, an, an intensive process on campus to surface areas in which the university could be uh, profoundly competitive, uh, both in terms of uh, basic research, applied technology, but also areas in which there was a strong resonance between the, uh, the life sciences industry community, areas of interest in joint investment, but also areas in which they just saw, look, there, you have folks here who are doing work that we maybe didn't even know about, that if we work together, we could bring products to market 
uh, including possibly developing some of them here in the Pioneer Valley, much faster and much better. The building itself, I really think both this planning process that the university engaged in with the state, some state support, as well as also the, the building and asset itself and the relationships that were developed it through it are going to be absolutely transformational for the Pioneer Valley and for Amherst and for the University of Massachusetts over the next five to ten years. It, it parallels actually an effort that the campus went through to develop something called the UMass Innovation Institute, which is something again actually that the Patrick administration and our office were, were strongly encouraging of because it makes um, licensing agreements, um, partnership agreements with industry much more transparent and easier and creates an infrastructure on campus of, of people, of organizations that can reduce the barrier of entry to, for both, to find the faculty who have a strong research interest in a given area and then uh, companies or other partners outside who have an interest in where they can match up effectively. So the research uh, agenda is still being driven by the faculty, it's still being driven by the scholastic enterprise that's traditional for a university, but that we can find those partners out in the marketplace um, and, and ease the path for them to engage. Now why is that important in terms of the building? The building that's going to be going up, $95 million building, is going to have in it both rapid prototyping space, which industry said is important. It's going to have co-location space, uh, or I, forgot, I think they're calling it co-laboratory space or something like that, coining a new term, in which they're going to be able to have startup companies and existing companies working with grad students and working with faculty and other students um, on campus, uh, really with cutting edge insights and cutting edge challenges and needs that are vo closely attuned to the business needs of, uh, of, of the private sector. Now I think that's going to have a tremendous, I'm, 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 I hate to say I guarantee it, but I have a high degree of confidence given the leadership of the campus, given the resonance with industry, given the quality of the research assets and, and other applied technology assets that are going to be in the building, that five to ten years from now you're going to see significantly expanded job growth in this area for middle skill jobs and vocational and community college educations as well as college educations uh, both um, in Amherst and in Hadley and in Sunderland and Northampton, but also folks who are doing manufacturing related work um, and, and other kind of uh, pr rapid prototyping and deployment work uh, in Holyoke and in Springfield and other areas. So I think it's really a game changing investment for, uh, for UMass Amherst and for the state. It really represents a model and an approach that we think we'd like to do more of. Well, though you mentioned jobs, and I think jobs are a big issue around this valley. And so, what kinds of jobs do you think are going to become available? I mean, obviously, part of this has to do with the strategic initiatives of collaborating with education. Yeah. But there are whole new fields of manufacturing right now, and new high-tech jobs that are emerging. And are you saying that this is actually going to be the answer? or a, a part of the answer to trying to create a workforce that is eligible and capable of dealing with these new jobs? I think it's a part of the answer. I mean, it's funny, I mean, I don't think you'd ever want to hang your hat on one particular thing. As a matter of fact, in planning and in economic development in general, we're always resistant to the sort of silver bullet, the, the one big thing, where in other examples you'll see it with like sports stadiums or things like that and other, other geographies will say, if we only had this, then our downtown will revitalize, and it frankly almost never works out the way you'd like. The reason why I think this is different is because you're talking really less about just even a building, although there's going to be an outstanding building with really remarkable assets in it that are going to be game-changing, I think, for a lot of the faculty groups and, and grad students in the area. But fundamentally, you're talking about, again, a shared perspective on engagement between industry of different sorts, from small companies like small manufacturers uh, to large companies that are really looking at whole new product lines and, and applications of materials and technology uh, to products and solutions that are out there or even conceptualized being out there in the marketplace and assets that we have on the campus. People who are do already have research interests that maybe are better or worse aligned with these new um, fields and industries but can be better. So I think the, the fact that you're talking about building a fundamental set of relationships that can evolve over time, the building can evolve over the time, but, but that the dialogue and the capabilities are there and the commitment is there on the parties to um, to surface new opportunities. So it's not always about the first contract or the first idea you have. It's about having a pipeline and a pathway to whole, developing whole new fields of inquiry, the things that we can't even imagine doing today. In terms of our manufacturers uh, and, and other kinds of job opportunities in the Valley, I think one of the things that's really important, I've, I've been involved in planning efforts in the Pioneer Valley around the Computing Center in Holyoke, around advanced manufacturing, statewide, but also in particular in Hamden County and Hampshire County, as well as this life sciences building. 
And a lot of people have asked at different points if we're spending a lot of time in Holyoke or spending a lot of time in Springfield or Amherst, they'll say, well, what's in, you know, I hate to say what's in it for me because it's not that, it's not selfish in a bad way. It's saying, look, you know, I, I'm in my community. I know people and neighbors who need job opportunities. What can, I, what can I do? What can I do or how can I connect them with opportunities that are going to touch, you know, this kid I know, this nephew or, the, you know, this uh, neighbor? And that's a really valid question. One of the things that I think is very special about the Valley, and I think it's really an important insight about looking where these job opportunities are going to be and who can benefit from them, is that we already have different kinds of capabilities, different kinds of identities for our communities now. And I think the identity you see now is going to be where you're going to see opportunities flower in the future. So uh, if you look at Springfield or in, in Chicopee and Westfield, there's a very strong precision manufacturing base down there. Also a lot of good uh, warehouse and distribution assets as well, as well as excellent financial services and call center and other kinds of uh, insurance and financial service related activity down there. You have obviously in Amherst in this area, it's a great place to do um, office work and, and, uh, and other different kinds of research and consulting and testing work. And then if you look at uh, the spectrum of places uh, from Holyoke on down, as well as up to Greenfield, there's a really a great opportunity in base of skills in manufacturing. And so one of the things we're doing um, in all the different pockets of work is we're trying to make sure we're connecting it. So our Life Sciences Center and our Life Sciences Initiative is thinking about medical device manufacturing and connecting to the market opportunities that our manufacturers can take advantage of. Our Advanced Manufacturing Collaborative, on the other hand, is thinking about how it connects to the process of innovation so that our existing companies aren't just out there on an island, but can, can take advantage of new processes and new technologies that connect to things like they'll be in the building. Well, in addition to manufacturing, one of the big issues we have is communication, not only communication with Boston, but also just communication in the Valley. So could you talk a little bit about the efforts of the Mass Broadband Commission? Yeah, the, Mass the Massachusetts Broadband Institute was formed back in 2007, I think, maybe 2008, um, by the legislature and the governor. And the commitment, uh, as, as you know, there are a number of communities in western Massachusetts that are still operating on dial-up. They have no access at all to, it's hard, it's even, by the way, for those people out there who have, uh, you know, cable accessed broadband through Comcast or something like that or Charter, um, it's hard to even conceptualize right. connecting to the internet with all the rich content and media and streaming video and, and things like that. Yeah, possibilities for education. Yeah, possibilities for education for, yeah. for health, for also uh, delivery of, of diagnostic services for home health care. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really impossible to imagine anybody existing in the current marketplace and current communities just operating on dial-up alone. Well, there are a number of communities that currently are in that boat. That's also true of their community health centers, it's true of their town halls, it's true of their elementary schools and their libraries. So what the, but we know about this and it's a challenge that the governor has been very committed in the legislature, particularly in this area, you talk to Senator Rosenberg and Senator Downing uh, in Western Massachusetts who've been really great leaders on this topic. Um, so the Institute, took a, a pot of, uh, of state money initially to, to launch deployment of uh, a broadband service in, for the unserved in the area. Um, when uh, President Obama came in office, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act included a substantial amount of money. Um, I, I want to say something upwards of $70 million, but maybe that may be the total amount um, of, of, that was also received by the Commonwealth to create a, uh, a, a fiber optic uh, backbone, what's called a backbone network, but basically the network um, that, would, that is being launched is already, there's already one link up in Otis, Massachusetts, in Springfield and Otis, Massachusetts. There are gonna be others that are deployed between now and the fall um, that will connect major institutions, elementary schools, town halls, over 1,300 in fact, community health centers with um, fiber optic, very rapid broadband service which we think will be transformational for all the kinds of things you're talking about, about learning and health. But um, the follow-on from that is going to be a last mile, so-called last mile solution, which will then connect people over the next two to three years to their homes with, uh, with uh, high-speed broadband service. And obviously, that's critical for all the kinds of learning and uh, uh, health-related and uh, municipal service sort of activity that you're talking about. But frankly, also, for if you own a home in an area that doesn't currently have broadband, you already know that you're disadvantaged substantially when trying to sell that home. So we think, frankly, if you look now at the, at the Pioneer Valley in Western Mass and look at areas that don't have broadband, um, these communities over the last couple decades have become substantially disadvantaged with any kind of investment. 
um, that, that and this, this, this will not only put them on an equal footing in terms of individual quality of life, but also from a business and, and commercial development standpoint, put them on an equal footing as well. And we're committed to doing that. Well, it sounds from everything you've been talking about, like we are really on a way of rebounding from the bad economy that, we, that the United States has gone through in the past few years. And how long do you think we're going to really see, how long will it take for us to really see some major change in Western Massachusetts? Well, you know, as a first background, interestingly enough, if you look at the last couple of recessions that the state went through, uh, and I think if Boston gets a head cold, we get the flu out here in our area, um, that, uh, that the, we were slower to recover jobs and slower to uh, have economic growth in our state back in the recessions of 89 to 92, as well as also 2001. And one of the things that we're, we're pleased to report, and I think it's because of the diversity of our, uh, of our innovation economy in the state, um, we've already recovered all the jobs in the Commonwealth that were lost during this past recession. So we've regained peak employment, one of only seven states in the nation to do that. Uh, and so we've been growing faster and stronger than other states. Really what that does for us, frankly, because everyone would like the economy to be better, is just put us in a better position now to accelerate our growth. I think when you look at the Pioneer Valley and you look at the investments that have been made in, again, education and infrastructure, in things like broadband to radically reshape the connectivity of this region. If you look at key investments in things like the Holyoke Computing Center and really the work around that to sponsor and, and foster innovation and entrepreneurship, as well as things like the UMass has been doing with its building program and its life sciences program, I think, I think you're going to see a fundamentally different trajectory for the Pioneer Valley in Western Mass over the next five to ten years than you have before. I think, I think Western Mass, even though 90 miles to Boston, or 100 depending on where you are, is still an awfully long way if you're driving it all the time like I am. Um, the fact of the matter is, in terms of commerce, in terms of innovation, we are better connected now to global markets and to the opportunities to participate in that growth than ever before in the Pioneer Valley. I think that's a great way to wrap up this segment. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today. You've had some great insights, and thank you for sharing those with us. You're welcome. This is Eric Nakajima, who is the uh, Assistant Secretary for Innovation Policy of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. I'm glad I don't have to answer your phone for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great to have you here, and it's nice to know so many wonderful things are happening in the Commonwealth. Great. I'm Jaris Hansen, here for Technology Matters. Thank you. Thank you.